Tonight, what we're going to do is just have a look at the realms of existence as they're talked about uh, basically in the Theravada tradition. But I'm, I should say at the beginning that in the Mahayana tradition, it's very, very similar. There are just a few small kind of uh, differences. Again, this is where we are, the world of human beings. It's interesting if you look at it, we're really near the bottom. <laughs> There's a lot of worlds above, all the way to the top. And the downfalls down here are just a small section. The human beings are just a small section. The world of the various gods is enormous. It goes really many, many different layers. They're also very highly populated and go to the top level of existence. One thing I'd like to point out at the beginning is, because this I think really important, the Dugati or the bad destinations are just these four at the bottom. And the Sugati or the good destinations far outnumber the bad destinations. The bad destinations are only a small section of samsara. The good destinations, that means from the world of human beings on up, the god levels, that means the deva levels, the brahma levels, and so on, the pure lands, and so on. There's many more of them. What it corresponds to, if you remember, I've spoken about this before, in the Abhidhamma analysis of the mind, the amount of um, bad thoughts, of akusala thoughts, is, is uh, only you know, so much. And the, the enumeration of the good thoughts that people can have, they're called sobhanachittas. The sobhanachittas are very much more. And so it's a bit similar to this, you see. Now one thing I want to say at the beginning is, this is like a schematic representation of the realms that people can be born in. But they're not only just like physical realms or uh, spiritual realms, uh, they correspond to psychological realms. In Buddhism, one of the most important insights, I think, is that the, the cosmological world reflects the psychological world. And the psychological world is reflected in the cosmological world. That means the realms that you find kind of physically or spiritually, those realms you also find in anybody's psyche as well. And they correspond very closely. Like if we go above the sensual worlds, mainly people live in the sensual worlds, yeah? That means they're getting sense contact, and according to that contact, they're acting and reacting. And they're feeling happy or they're feeling unhappy. But if you go beyond those realms, into the realms of the meditative attainments, these realms, the Brahma realms, correspond their jhana lava. That means people who have attained to jhana get reborn in these realms. But also, if you get the jhanas in this life, this is the corresponding realm that you find yourself in. It goes first jhana, second jhana, third jhana, fourth jhana. So the psychological attainments that you can get through meditation or not get through meditation, like down here in the sense worlds, are mirrored in the cosmological worlds. Similarly, if you behave like an animal, it's like you're at an animal's level. An animal's level is down, in, down here. If you behave like a human, you're in the human level. If you behave like a god, you're in the god level. If you attain to the jhanas, you're in the Brahma levels. If you attain to the immaterial jhanas, 
it's like you're right up here. And psychologically, that's also how it feels. It's like being in a different world altogether. So that's a very important thing because you don't find that teaching quite in any other religion, I think. The correspondence between the psychological and the cosmological in Buddhism is a very striking characteristic that you don't really find in other religions. And because the Buddha was like a master psychologist who had himself attained all these levels, knew all these worlds, he was able to identify them and describe them so that you could understand them, you know. It's not in any way confused. If you look at other, other religions, when they're talking about the heavens, for instance, sometimes their gods are not behaving like gods. They're behaving like demons. They're vengeful, they're angry, and so on like that. Now, we have angry and vengeful gods, but they don't exist in this area. They exist in this area. They're the Azura. Those are the fallen gods. You see, it's like the Buddha really had seen and understood all the levels of existence and could put them in the right place, you know, and didn't kind of confuse these people up. Sometimes when you see the descriptions of the Abrahamic gods, sometimes they're very beautifully described. And they're if you look at the descriptions of the gods in the suttas, they're also described in a very similar way. They're at god levels, like this sort of level. And at other times, they're described like these vengeful demons. But the vengeful demons, you see, are actually part of the downfall. They're actually part of the apaya. And they are not to be worshipped, you know? So that's an important thing, you see the precision with which the various worlds are talked about and explained is really quite tremendous, you know. And it only comes because, you know, the person who could uh, give these descriptions knows what he's talking about, you know. He's seen these different levels of existence, if you like. Now, an interesting thing is these are bad destinations, these are good destinations. The Brahma Lokas include the Sudarvasas, that's the Pure Lands. I'll discuss these areas, we'll take it one by one. Karma Loka, Rupa Loka, uh, these uh, Pure Lands and then the Arupa Loka. But just giving, still giving an overview, if you can read on the side here, it says, attain through dana, generosity, and sila, virtue. That means manusa loka and deva loka. That means human beings and the sensual god levels. They're attained through generosity and virtue. That means your precepts and, you know, like doing dana and so on. To attain these levels, these levels are attained through meditative development. That means bhavana. So you'll often hear that when monks are teaching, uh, they teach about dana, sila, and bhavana. Yeah, dana, sila, bhavana. It comes all the time. Dana and sila will get you back into manusa loka, that means the world of human beings, or into the lower guard levels. That's the sensual guard levels. But if you want to get into the high levels, these levels, those are attained through meditative attainment. Apart from the pure lands, they, you need more to attain the pure lands, which means you must have wisdom as well. Because it's only anagamis, that's people at the third level of sainthood, if you like. It's only anagamis that get reborn in the Sudhawas, of the Pure Lands. And from there, Anagami itself, the word means non-returner. They don't return down. From there, they go out of existence. They attain Nibbana. 
So that's just like an overview. So we'll have a little bit closer look now. This is the Karma Loka, just this bottom part. Okay. So in the Karma Loka, there's actually 11 levels to it. Four levels are the what we what we call the downfalls, the paya. It means falling away. If your actions are guided by greed, hatred, and delusion, these are the levels that you fall into. There's a really scary kind of thing that the Buddha told one time, where he said, more people go down than ever come up. That means when you've fallen down into these levels, it's very, very difficult to get out of them. Because there's no room in these levels f to make merit or to do good actions. Why? Because your mind is constantly overcome by bad states of mind. Sometimes when people fall into these worlds, they have a stock of merit. And after they've kind of paid their dues, when they've kind of uh, recompensed for their bad deeds, they can come back up. Most people, of course, have committed both good and bad deeds. That's why you're here and not here, isn't it? And it's interesting that these levels correspond to, to these three bad states. So the Azura Loka, which is the world of the Furman demons, these demons originally, they were in Tarvatimsa, the, at the seventh level. And what happened actually, quite interesting, is they got drunk. Right? The, the gods also have kind of human characteristics. So these gods got drunk and then they got into revolt against Saka. This is Saka's abode. Saka is the lord of the gods, yeah. So they got drunk and they started fighting against Saka and his retinue. And then Saka threw them out of Tarvatimsa, which is a very nice heaven. We'll come to it in a while. It's a very nice place to be. And they fell down through existence into the world of the fallen demons. That's now called the Azura Loka. Azura itself actually means like the anti-god in a way. They have godlike powers, but they fight against the gods. So that's, the, that's that level. And their minds are overcome by two qualities, which is hatred and jealousy. Because they, could, they know where they come down from, and then they're jealous of the gods who are still there. So you see, their minds are always encompassed by, if you like, bad qualities. And it's a characteristic of these lower levels that that's, you know, what their minds are like. So if your mind is constantly overcome by hatred, how are you going to do anything meritorious and get out of that position? Now, psychologically, it's very interesting also because many people find themselves in the same position. Their minds are overcome by hatred. They're jealous of being people in a better position. They want to be in a pos better position, but because their minds are always constantly overcome by hatred, they never get there. It's counterproductive, you know? If you find yourself in a lower realm, psychologically, the, the worst thing is to hold on to that anger, hold on to any of those bad states of mind, because you'll just stay there. Obviously, if you're continuing with your mind at that level, that's the level you're at. I think everybody heard of the law of attraction. So if you're producing bad qualities of mind, you keep yourself in that position. What is more, 
like even the people who gather around you are at the same level. If you are always angry, the sort of person that you're with is always angry and you cannot get out of that level. And many people find that, you know. They fall down from a human level, if you like, and because their minds are overcome by those qualities, they can't get back up. This is the Peter level, the realm of hungry ghosts. We say hungry ghosts, it's influenced actually by the Chinese conception. In fact, it just says Piti Visya in the Pali. The Piti Visya, Piti means fathers. It just means the ancestors. Originally, the ancestor realms. But it got kind of re-envisioned, if you like. Not all people who pass away go to these realms. But somehow it became re-envisioned and the Peter Yoni or the uh, Piti Visio became the realm for those creatures who had passed away and were reborn with a mind overcome by greed. The hungry ghosts are hungry. Their main quality is, you know, they have a great desire, like they desire to eat, they desire to drink, but they have you know, when, when we see them, they have these huge bellies and they have tiny mouths. They have a huge desire and a very tiny way of fulfilling that desire. Hatred, you see, at the demon level, greed, loba, at the hungry ghost level, and tirachanayoni the animal realm. So, what is the characteristic of animals? It's really that they're deluded. Their minds are overcome by delusion. They cannot understand or comprehend, even on a level that we can. Their moral quality is very low. It isn't that a dog cannot show affection, and we all like it when they do. But most animals, their main kind of mental quality is that they're overcome by delusion. They cannot understand the world that they're in and they cannot respond to it in a way that will get them out of there either. Most dogs do not perform dhanas. Most dogs do not keep you know, their precepts. I mean, anybody can see. They just act according, if you like, to their instincts. They have no way of controlling their instincts. And when we see a human being acting in the same way, they're not able to control their sexual instinct, they're not able to control their aggressive instinct, we say they're like an animal. Because their minds have become animalistic. Their minds have become like an animal. So they, you know, in a way they might as well be animals. And in their next life, they quite possibly will be animals. If you live in an animalistic way all the way through your life, just following your sexual instinct, just following your aggressive instinct and so on like this, where are you going to get reborn? Are you going to get reborn as a god? It isn't going to happen. Because the mind that you've created guides you into the next worlds. If you've been behaving like a god in this life, quite possibly you'll get reborn as a god in the next life. If you've been behaving like one of these lower levels, quite possibly you'll get reborn in these lower levels. But it's very, very dangerous. It's very, very dangerous indeed to fall down into these levels. So, besides anything else, it's a good reason for maintaining just a basic level of precepts. If you've got precepts, we saw you get born in these levels. If you've got precepts, generosity, other good qualities of mind, these are the sort of levels 
that you get born in, if you've lost your precepts, if your mind's overcome by hatred, greed, delusion, you get born in these lower levels. If your mind is overcome by all of them, greed, hatred and delusion, you get reborn in Niriya. That's the hell realms. Why? Your mind is like hell. If your mind is overcome by greed, hatred and delusion, your mind is like a living hell. And it's a hell for you, it's a hell for everybody else. If you ever see anybody in that state. So they get reborn in the hell worlds. Now, one way of describing the different hell worlds uh, is according to eight different levels. So they, they have the Sanjeevo level, Kala Sutta level, the um, Sangata level, the Rova level, Mahavarova, Tapawan. They all have meanings, right? This means Sanjeevo, for instance, means reviving. What happens is, you, in that level, you get killed, and as soon as you're killed, you get revived. And then you get killed again. Somebody comes along with a sword and kills you. Right? And then you revive, and they kill you again. It's a hell. Now then, I got, I got some photographs of hell. You see, holding a... while pulling, pulling out her lips. These are the tormentors in hell. Sometimes you just get hung up. And then the birds come along and peck at you. Sometimes they spear you through the top of your head. <laughs> or they boil up lead and then they pour it through your mouth. Okay, you see here what they're doing. They carry people to the top of the mountain and then throw them off. Right, so they're, all their bones smash when they get to the bottom. If this is Sanjeeva, what happens is they get back up and then somebody picks them up, takes them to the top of the mountain, and throws them off again. I want you to notice this guy, by the way. Okay. This is Pramalai, sawing people in half. You see, chopping, chopping them into little bits, beating with clubs. And they're all kind of naked and defenseless. That's the idea. And picked on by birds and, you know, the birds carry them off. And there's, you see these things. These are discuses that are flying through the air and they occasionally hit you and chop you in half. These are adulterers. Adulterers like to cling to their lovers. And now they have to cling to a thorn tree. And what is more, they can't get off it. They're constantly on that thorn tree and it's ripping their flesh apart. So if you see, if you see you're seeing the birds again, you see. These horrible birds. But who's this? Pramalai. See all the schools at the bottom and animals. If they try to get down from the tree, then the dogs bite them. Then they have to climb back up the thorn tree, you see. Who's this? Pramalai. And all these people are worshipping him. These are people thrown into hell and they're worshipping Pramalai. Why? Because he's gone down to the hell, hell realms to teach Dhamma. So when he comes down to teach them Dhamma, then they have a chance of getting out. That's kind of like the idea. Now then, in the Mahayana, you have the earth store, Bodhisattva. You know, we, we say in Sanskrit, Shitigaba. That's a Bodhisattva. So you have the idea of Shitigaba, who goes to hell, and he brings relief to the hell beings. During Hungry Ghost Month, they have all these pujas for Shitigaba. So in the Thai tradition, they have something similar. Probably under the influence of the Chinese, actually. Because we don't know about this in Sri Lanka. I never heard of Pramalai. But Pramalai is based on an arahat 
who was born in Sri Lanka, I think around the 12th or 13th century. In Sri Lanka, we call him Maliadeva. Maliadeva, when I was ordained, we used to know about Maliadeva because it was said that Maliadeva was the last arahant in Sri Lanka. But somehow his legend traveled to Thailand and then it was transformed probably under the influence of uh, earth, earth store bodhisattva, Sh Shittigarbha. And then they have an idea that Maliadeva or Pramalai, he descends into hell and he teaches Dhamma for the hell beings. And that way, through listening to Dhamma, listening to Dhamma is a meritorious thing in itself. So that way, they have some sort of chance of, you know, progressing out of that realm, if you like. So he is like a kind of, he's acting like a savior for these beings that have really fallen away. So you remember Pramalai. In, in Thai tradition, you talk to any Thai monk, they'll tell you the stories of Pramalai. It's very popular, uh, very well known. But in Sri Lanka, we don't know it. In Burma, we don't know it. In Malaysia, as far as I can see, you don't know it. More, more tortures for your imagination tonight. You know, this is the arm and this is the leg. When the kings were torturing thieves, this is how they would do it. These are drawn from what people have seen, if you see what I mean. And this is this thing that's eternally cutting his head and like, like an eternally bad headache, you know. And then the fire realms. In the Tibetan tradition, they have an interesting thing because I think if this is right, there's eight hell realms. Four of them are hot realms and four of them are cold realms. So in four of them, you're getting burned. Like t Tapana, one, one of the hells is called Tapana. Tapana means heat. It's the hot realm. This I thought was interesting, you see. It's an interesting depiction of people in hell. One of the things that they say about hell is that it's claustrophobic. Like being completely enclosed. And you, you're afraid you want to break out, but you can't break out. It's too, everything is kind of so close around you. And you want to get out from that, but you can't get out. There's nowhere to go. Now then, up until, I think, around 1900, up until that time, there was only something like one billion people on earth. Two billion didn't come till about 1930. Three billion is something like 1950. It goes on like that. I can't remember the exact dates because I didn't make notes or anything. We hit six billion around 2000. In 12 years, there's one billion more people on Earth. And it's projected, you know, the projections are that by 2050, there'll be nine, I think, nine and a half billion people. Every second, 1.8 people die. Every minute, 105 people die. Every hour, 6,000 people. But every year, 55 million people die in the world. That's more than twice the population of Malaysia. It has this nice quote, actually. The accumulation of one person's bones during one aeon, and we've been in samsara for many, many aeons, would be a mass as big as a mountain, so said the Buddha. If you've just piled up the bones that you yourself have had, it's like a mountain of bones. But what it doesn't show on here, but what is important is, every second there are 1.8 deaths in the world, Every second, there are 2.5 births in the world. There are more people being born than there are dying. So even though people are dying at a phenomenal rate, 55 million a year, there's about 75 million being born. 
So the population is increasing. Seven billion people in the world. It sounds like a lot, isn't it? But it's absolutely tiny when you compare it to the animal realm. Yeah. Seven billion, you know, you compare it to ants. There are more ants in the world than ever you could imagine. Let alone count. You couldn't count them. You know, billions and billions and billions and billions and billions. Same with things like beetles and things like that. You know, insects are very, very successful as far as reproduction is concerned. Now, quite likely, at least a good percentage have fallen out of Manosa Loka. And now, you know, they're, they're crawling around in ant colonies, of which there are billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of them. So, you know, it ties in with what the Buddha was saying, more go down than ever come up. Another thing, that's just animals. There are also Azuras, there are also Peters, there are also Hells chock-a-block full. And also, there are heavenly realms. So the heavenly realms are also full of devas. It's said, for instance, again, I can't remember the exact number, but it said when the Buddha taught the first sermon, he taught it to five of his companions. But there were millions of devas came to listen. Because there's plenty of devas out there who want to listen to the Dhamma. And Brahmas as well. Same at the, on the Parinibbana um, deathbed. Then the amount of monks and nuns and lay people who gathered round the Buddha could probably be counted in hundreds. They called out the Mala village to come and pay their respects to the Buddha as he was dying. So maybe we could say hundreds of people. But again, there were millions of devas came to see the last moments of the Buddha on earth. There are millions and millions and millions and millions of devas as well. Important, you see, because getting a rebirth in the world of human beings is a very, very rare event in samsara. If all these other beings exist, the chances are you're not going to get reborn in this kind of tiny world of human beings. Because there's only so, so few of us. Whereas the other realms are so greatly populated. As I've told before many times, you know, about the rarities. You know, this is one advice. At the end of the daily chanting in Sri Lanka, the head monk will turn round and he will chant this advice to the other monks. Apamadena bhikave sampadeta. That was the la you know, this is known as the last words of the Buddha. Apamadena bhikave sampadeta. Strive on monks with heedfulness. But then it's elaborated here. The arising of a Buddha in this world is rare. In the periods of samsara, the times that there's a Buddha are very, very few and far between. There's, you know, that means not just the Buddha, but the Buddha Sasana. We're still living in a Buddha Sasana 2,500 years after the Buddha. But those periods where there's a Sasana are very, very small. When the sasana eventually finishes, you get a long, 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 long time when there's no chance of hearing the Buddha's teaching. The arising of a Buddha in the world is a very rare event. So you should consider, for one thing, that you have arisen at the time that the Buddha's teaching has arisen. The chances are, even if you get born in the world of human beings, it's going to be at a time that you can't hear the Dhamma. Or in a place where you can't hear the Dhamma. If you're born in Afghanistan, 
you're not going to hear the Dhamma. Acquiring a human existence is rare. That's what put me on to this thread. Even getting birth as a human being is extremely rare in samsara. There's many other places you can get reborn and likely to get reborn. The third one, gaining confidence is rare. You know yourselves, lots of people hear the Dhamma and they pay no attention. They hear what is being taught and it just doesn't click somehow. It just doesn't make a change in their heart. Even during Lord Buddha's time, same thing. Many people came to the Buddha when the Buddha was alive and they listened to his teaching and they weren't convinced. They went away unconvinced. If that's the case, when a Buddha is teaching, you know, what chance have us monks got? So again, you see, gaining confidence, that means hearing the teaching and deciding to do something about it, that means put it into effect in your own life. That also is a very rare thing. Many people hear the Dhamma, only a few act on it. The next one you see, because this is chanted for, particularly in a way, for monks, being one gone forth is rare. That means getting the chance to ordain is also a great rarity, you know. Most people who have confidence have other things as well. Wives, children, jobs, responsibilities to their parents. A hundred and one other things which prevents them from being in a position where they can dedicate their lives to putting the teaching into practice. You see how many rarities come together. Handadani bika vayamantiyami o vayadamma sankara apamadena sampadeta. This was the last words of the Buddha, yeah? Come now, monks, for I tell you, all conditioned things, all sankara, everything that's come together is subject to decay. That means eventually it's going to fall apart. Strive on with heedfulness. There are states of mind that can be produced that have fixed destinies. If you've done certain acts or attained certain states, they have fixed destinies. That means if you've murdered your father and mother, if you've killed an arahat, or if you've managed to injure a Buddha, these sort of things no matter what you do afterwards, it's a fixed destiny, you get reborn in hell. You might regret it and you might, you know, do a thousand good things afterwards, but it's a fixed destiny and for some time you get reborn in hell. If you have regretted it and you did do good things afterwards, you've got a chance of getting back out, you know, because you've got some store of merit. On the other side, if you've attained jhana and maintain those levels, you get reborn in the brahma levels. Similarly, fixed destinies, if you've attained path and fruit, like if you've attained sotapanna, then we, you can say that you only get seven lives wherever it is. You don't go down. You don't go down to these levels and you get seven, seven lives somewhere in the good destinies, in the Sugatis, at the very most, and then you pass out of existence. I'm just explaining that because most of us are not in one or other of those positions. So we're in a situation where we could go either way. According to our past kama, not just in this life, we might know what our kama is in this life, but we don't know exactly what it was in a previous life, or in hundreds of previous lives, or thousands of previous lives. So we're in a state of uncertainty. It could be that after this life, even if we've lived well, that we fall down. And it could be, even if we've not lived so good, that we go up because 
the kamic story, if you like, is not just one life, and it's a balance over those all those lives. So the Buddha did teach this in there's a sutta in Majjhima Nikaya called Chulakama Vibhanga Sutta, and he said sometimes people see that people have done bad things and they get reborn in heaven, and then they think there's no moral order in the world. Why? Because they're only looking at one existence, and they're making a judgment only on one existence. Somebody who's done bad, and then they get a heavenly reward. How can it be? It's an immoral situation. But the fact is, there's not just one existence. That person has been a long, long time in samsara. At other times, he's been producing merit. It's that merit that is coming to fruition that gets him reborn in heaven. The demerit that he's produced in that immediate past life will eventually get him to fall from heaven. Similarly, and not unimportantly, uh, sometimes people see the people who did very good things fall down. And then again, they think this is an amoral universe. Because somebody who does good falls down. So then they think, shouldn't do good. Yeah, people do think like this, you know. They see people doing good and never do they, you know, even in this life, never do they get like the reward that you would think that they should get. Yeah. But they only look at one life. They don't look at the span of lives that it's giving rise to those conditions. Although they're doing good now, maybe in past lives, everybody got mixed karma. In past lives, they've done bad things. We all have. But the generality of it is, of course, that you do good deeds, you go up. You do bad deeds, you go down. What we're looking at is the 31 planes of existence. That is one way of analyzing the different levels. If we wanted to, we could count Niriya as eight levels, isn't it? There's eight hells. This is just one way of analyzing it. The reason I want to say that is because above Manusa Loka and below the world of the four great kings, there is actually, in fact, another realm, which is what we call the Brahma Deva. That means the earth gods. They are what you can say like the tree sprites, the mountain gods, the river gods, the gods and powerful beings that you find in the nature realm. That's why they're called Brahma Deva. Earth gods. They're not above the earth, they're at the same level of the earth. All, all these creatures are known in all the traditional societies. They're given different names, but they're all known in um, traditional societies. And they always have the same sort of characteristics. Like the, the low level god that lives in a river. Of course, if it lives in a big river, it becomes a more important god like Ganga, for instance, the goddess Ganga. Also, interestingly, I don't know why, maybe there is some sort of reason that could be figured out, but normally river gods are female and mountain gods are male. All of these realms, the sensual world realms, no sexual differentiation. Above these realms, in the Brahma Lokas, there's no sexual differ differentiation. But in the Karma Loka, there's sexual differentiation amongst the gods as well. So those Brahma Deva come between Manusa Loka and Chatu Maharajika uh, Loka. The Ch Chatu Maharajika Loka is the world of the four great kings. Now they all rule over a kind of entourage or an army of beings, if you like. So Vesavana's army are the Yakas. 
The Yakas also have this kind of mixed mythological history. They started by being quite high devas. You know, here, of course, they're above Manusa, you see. They're actually at a good high level. Over the course of the last 2,000 years, <coughs> they kind of fallen down to like the Azura level. I'm not saying that's what's happened, but in popular imagination, that's what's happened. And now, if you get like um, an evil spirit in Sri Lanka or whatever, they call it a yaka. It's like they've kind of fallen down, just like the Azuras fell down, you see. But yakas originally, at the time of Lord Buddha, were, were the, the conception about them is that they were very powerful beings, kind of semi-divine, if you like, above the human world, not at the top level. All, all people within the sense worlds, from the Nirya Loka to the um, Paranimata Vasavatana uh, Loka, all, the, all of them are subject to the same sorts of passions, if you like, as human beings are. That means they get angry, they get lustful, they get deluded and so on. The higher you are, the less it is. The lower you are, the more it is. So yakas also could sometimes get angry, you see. One yaka, for instance, did a very stupid thing. When Sariputta and Moggallana were going through the countryside one time, then one yaka got it into his head that he was going to smash Sariputta on the head with his fist. And the other yaka said, don't do that. And he said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to hit him on the head with my fist. And he said, don't do that. And he went and he hit Sariputta on the head. Now this is a big yaka. So he smashed Sariputta on the head. And then Sariputta kind of scratched his head going, oh, what was that about? But the yaka immediately fell into hell. You see, the earth opened up and the yaka went straight to hell. Even at this level, you see, they have contrary minds like we have. So they can sometimes get it into their brains to do something stupid. We do also, isn't it? Sometimes without meaning to, even though we're generally acting intelligently and well and for the benefit of others and ourselves and things, sometimes just kind of it comes over you and you do something stupid. So it happens with yakas as well, you see. Virulika and the uh, Kambandikas. The Kambandikas are like dwarfs, like little fat creatures, very powerful. There's not so much information about Kambandikas, to be quite honest. They don't figure so much. Bhattarato, which is uh, Dhristarashtra, that means, um, you know, this strong ruler, he rules over the Gandabas. The Gandabas are the heavenly musicians. Normally when they're pictured, they're pictured with a lute. Their kind of role is that they play beautiful celestial music. And then Virupaka, his group is the Nagas. The Nagas, it's an interesting word in, in a way. The Nagas are the serpent kings. That means, you know, even in India, perhaps even here, I'm not sure, but in India, even to today, they will worship like the cobras. Why? The cobras have the power of life and death over you. If a cobra strikes you, you die. It's a really powerful creature. So these cobras became like deified. You'll remember when the Buddha attained enlightenment, after the enlightenment, uh, during one of the weeks when he was still in the area of the Bodhi tree, Muchilinda came and shielded him from the weather. The Nagas are these kind of powerful, snake-like, dragon-like creatures. In China, of course, you know, it's conceptualized as a dragon. The dragons are very strong, and powerful. So the Nagas are the same. That's the 
realm of the Chatur Maharajika Deva Loka, which is conceptualized as being on Mount Meru, about halfway up Mount Meru. Mount Meru is what we now call Mount Kailash. Meru was thought of as being the center of the universe. At the base of it is like a huge ocean. One part of that ocean, there is an island or a continent, if you like, Jambudipa. Jambudipa is what we now call India. And there's three other continents around Mount Meru. This is the ancient conception of the world, if you like. The Chetan Maharajika Deva are like halfway up Mount Meru. That's their abode. And some of them actually live in Vimanas, if you know what a Vimana is. A Vimana is like a floating palace. It's, it's a beautiful mansion that floats in the air. This is a Vimana, you see. It's like a mansion. These are the gods on the clouds. If you do a lot of good deeds, you get reborn as a god at this level and you get a whole Vimana to yourself. And you can live in this palace in the sky. Some of them are ladies. These are lady signs. And some of them are men. They got moustaches. This is an interesting one, but we haven't got to this level yet. But this is an interesting one because this is the Buddha teaching the Abhidhamma to his mother in Tarvatimsa. Mahamaya died seven days after the birth. She was reborn as a Deva Puta, that means uh, a male Deva actually, a male Deva in Tarvatimsa. In the Sun's Rains Retreat, then the Buddha went to heaven and he spent the Rains Retreat in heaven teaching the Abhidhamma to his mother. Sariputta was spending the Rains Retreat on earth, but every day he would go up to Tarvatimsa and listen to what the Buddha was teaching his mum, and then he came down and he taught the monks. That's, that's the story, you see, that's the mythology behind the origins of the Abhidhamma. This is the Buddha teaching the gods. Gods have iconography. So Sakudeva always is green. Similarly, we have a one, two, three, and on the other side, four-headed Brahma god. The Brahma god, both in Buddhist and Hindu Iconography is always portrayed with four faces. He can see in all four directions. It's like saying he's uh, something like omniscient, you see. So Sakadeva lives in the world of the 33 divinities. By saying the 33 divinities, it doesn't mean that there's only 33. But there's 33 chief divinities, that's what it means. And then there's thousands of other divinities as well that live at the same level. That is also where the Azuras were living before they got drunk and into a fight with Saka and then got chased out of heaven. So they were living in this very nice heavenly abode and then they got themselves into big trouble. Saka, by the way, is a post, not a person. When one Saka dies, another Saka is reborn in that position. When that Saka dies, another Saka is born in that position. But there's always a Saka. The present one is Sotapanna. So that means he will only have so many more existences. For Saka, it's only for him. The way he is experiencing reality is that Time has gone very, very slowly, to our level anyway, it's going very, very slowly. And it means it's only now 25 days since the Buddha passed away. One day of the gods equals a hundred years of human life. So it's only a short time as far as Saka is concerned. It only happened a couple of weeks ago. But as far as we're concerned, it's happened 2,500 years ago. 
What I was saying that for is, even you get to be born as Saka, you see, he's not going to live for 25 days and then get reborn. He's going to live for a long, 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 long time in that position and then he gets reborn. And maybe he has seven more lives. That means he's got still a long, long time in samsara, even though he's a Sotapanna. So getting to be Sotapanna is really an important thing and because it, it changes your whole position. You know you're not going to go down. But it doesn't mean that you're just going to jump straight out either. In the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, Ananda came to the Buddha and said, uh, somebody has died in this village. Uh, which realm was he reborn in? And then the Buddha explained that that person was an Anagami. He'd been reborn in the Pure Lands and from there he will attain Nibbana without ever coming back to earth. And then Ananda came and said, there's another person has died. Right? What is his destiny? And the Buddha said, this person, uh, having attained jhana, was reborn in the Brahma Lokas. And then Ananda came and said, another person has died. And then another person has died. And another person has died. And another person has died. And the Buddha said, if every time I have to answer the question where somebody has been rebirth, it's going to become tiring for me, Ananda. <laughs> so I'll teach you the mirror of the Dhamma, knowing which you can understand whether you're Sotapanna or not. So he told that somebody who is Sotapanna, how they can know it is if they have perfect faith in the Buddha, perfect faith in the Dhamma, perfect faith in the Sangha and they never break their precepts. These are known as the Sotapati Anga. Anga means, it means the four factors that identify the Sotapanna. Now it's also a good one because why is that? Why do you gain perfect faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha? The reason is because you see from your own experience, in your own depths of your heart, that the teaching worked. Up to now, for most of us, we believe in the teaching. A Sotapanna doesn't believe in the teaching anymore. He knows that the teaching works. Again, just like this thing that he can't fall into the lower realms, changes his whole position in samsara, so his psychology is changed so that he has perfect faith in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha and he never breaks his precepts. Because of not breaking the precepts, of course, is one of the kind of reasons why you don't go down. If somebody claims that they're a Sotapanna, right, you can't tell about their psychological state. You can't tell. They might say, I have perfect faith in the Buddha. I have perfect faith in the Dhamma. You can't tell whether it's true or not. But if you see them breaking their precepts, you can know that it's not true. If you yourself attain Sotapanna, uh, you know it. There is a knowledge that arises that you know that the situation has changed. You're not in any doubt. Above Saka's realm is the Yama realm. There's hardly any information I don't know anything much about the Yama, Yamadeva realm because there's nothing much said. Some of these realms, they're kind of identified. Like we know, for instance, who is the ruler. Like Saka is the ruler in Tarvatimsa. The ruler in Yama is Suyama. Tusita Deva Loka is a very important Loka. It means the world of the contented. This is important because all bodhisattvas, before they're reborn on earth and attain Buddhahood, their last life is always in Tusita Devaloka. Our bodhisattva was born there. His last human life was as Vasantara. Many times you will hear people say that the Buddha's last life was Vasantara. It's not his last life, it's his last human life. His last life before he was reborn as Siddhartha is as Setuketu. And then, 
what happens is the guards come and beg him or come and plead with him to be reborn on earth and he makes the decision uh, to come down to earth and he looks for the right conditions must have the right country the right family the right mother there's five conditions yeah so our uh, bodhisattva did the same thing and he decided to be reborn in Mahamaya's womb and he descended for that rebirth when he descended for that rebirth another bodhisattva was born in Tusita Deva Loka his name is Nata Nata later a long time later uh, but it's not that long in their time as you go up in the realms the days get longer if you see what I mean later the gods will go and ask him to be reborn and then he will descend to earth and take human birth according to the way it's told his name will be Ajita when he attains Buddhahood he is known as Metteya or Maitri Buddha but at the moment he's Nata Deva living in Tusita Deva Loka the Manarati Deva Loka is the Devas who delight in creation so what, what they do if you like is they make beautiful sense objects for themselves to enjoy that's how they spend their time just making beautiful sense objects that they then enjoy there's not much more about this this realm either but the next realm is the Paranimita Vasavati uh, Deva Loka which is the world of the divinities wielding power over the creation of others these divinities make beautiful sense objects and these divinities enjoy them they don't have to make them themselves they've got these devas to make them for them so these when, the, when they're talking about beautiful sense objects they're not talking about you know these kind of gross sense objects they're talking about highly refined sense objects now you know you might think about very highly refined artistic levels or something like that so they make these beautiful beautiful objects and then these devas they just come along they don't have to make them they just come along and enjoy them where do you think Mara is living number four this level this is where Mara is he's the chief guard in this realm because Mara has control over the whole of the sensual world he's not just an evil being nowadays because of bad PR he gets portrayed as just like an evil being but he's not just an evil being he's actually a very high level Deva and he has control over the whole of the sensual worlds that's his realm Mara's realm is the realm of the senses that means even you get these highly refined sensual contacts still it's binding you into the rounds of samsara the sensual contact keeps you going round and round and round not just when it's gross even when it's refined so sometimes Mara tempts not with gross things that you might reject anyway but with very refined things that you find it very difficult to reject so you have to understand that you see because of the bad PR situation most people think that Mara dwells down here as long as you think he's dwelling down here you know you think you're already above him don't believe it Mara is above you and he knows more about how to keep you here than you know about how to get out what this is is like a schematic representation of the universe as I was saying at the beginning according to your own mental state 
you can be reborn in these worlds or you can understand that you're being reborn in these worlds if you have a very highly refined artistic sense for instance and that's where you find your joy or whatever it's like you're up here if you find your joy you get your kicks from killing people from hurting people from causing people distress your mind is down here if you only understand it as a, as a description like it's a description of a city or a country or something it has no meaning you know maybe it's true or maybe it's not true it it has no meaning like that but if you understand what i said at the beginning that the psychological worlds and the cosmological worlds mirror each other you see how this is relevant for you if i just describe all this and you don't understand what it means for you personally it's a waste of time really you know because you can go up in a spacecraft and you won't find these places you can take it like that as a spatial description as a geography of the universe but you can take it as a psychological geography of the universe and you can make all of this meaningful you understand where mara is you know to be careful about things you don't understand where he is you think he's down here and you've already got above him and you know escape from him you don't do the right things you don't understand your real position these realms are the brahma realms the brahmas are also devas but they're at a much higher level that means a much higher level of refinement and also they're not within the sensual realms for one thing as i was saying earlier they don't have sexual differentiation anymore they're kind of neuter if you like their bodies are not gross bodies like ours are or like animals are they're not made of this gross matter they're made of fine matter very refined matter if you like they correspond to the jhana levels this is pratama jhana the first absorption and then you know in the first jhana in the commentaries they divide it into three that means there's a very high level of the first jhana there's a middle level of the first jhana and a low level so these three correspond for for that level that means if you get yourself into seclusion and you do meditation to a reasonable high level for what's probably going to be like a prolonged time you can attain first jhana you can know what the worlds are like at this level also i think anybody who's uh, experienced meditation when you get into a higher state of mind it's like time is not passing you're just kind of floating in a timeless space their days are longer than the sensual world days and that's actually how it feels when you're in those levels of meditative development and the higher you go the more timeless it becomes so this corresponds to the first jhana this corresponds to the second jhana the three levels of the second jhana it's like the divinities are streaming radiance and bounded radiance and limited radiance you'll often hear people say i saw the light in many religions they will talk about seeing the light it's this sort of level that they've attained like second jhana from our point of view you're just about midway in samsara but from their point of view they've seen the light they it's they've seen god it's the end of the story but from our point of view it's only second jhana <laughs> same here you see the higher the level then at, th- at this level subakinika level it's just like extremely beautiful you know all the mind is so refined any sort of dukkha at this level has already passed away you have no feelings of dukkha there's only sukha that means there's only pleasant feelings at this level it's a really really beautiful realm to dwell in so 
the divinities are known as refulgent beauty, unbounded beauty, and then, you know, at the ones who are only limited, or only got a limited attainment, that's the limited beauty. That's third jhana. The fourth jhana level is this level. Okay, if you attain fourth jhana and you haven't got path and fruit to anagami stage, this is the level you're likely to be born into. It's the Vayapala Brahma Loka. Vayapala means great fruit. The, the world of the high divinities of great fruit. Greatly fruitful because it's, it's such a high level, you see. There's another level, which is an interesting one, actually. Especially for some of you who know uh, some of the Hindu teachings and some of the Zen teachings, which is called Sanyasatawasa the realm of unconscious beings. Now there's some types of meditation that people do where their aim is to completely suppress the mind so that there's no mind at all at that level of the meditation. If you are successful in that, when you get reborn, you get reborn here in the Asanya Satawasa. That's the realm of unconscious beings. They only have fine form and no mind. You get born with only a rupa. It's a fine rupa, but it's only a rupa. And eventually, like all of these, still get reborn, yeah? Now then, if you've attained anagami, anagami means non-returner. You never return to a lower level. You get reborn in the Pure Lands. The Pure Land teachings are quite common in Malaysia. They're based on the original cosmology that we know also in the Theravada. The main difference between the Pure Lands in the Theravada conception and the Mahayana conception is how you get there. In the Theravada conception, it's very, very difficult. In the Mahayana conception, just calling on Amitabha will get you reborn in the Pure Lands. And then you'll find Amitabha waiting for you. That means the Buddha of endless light is waiting for you. And from that level, you go out. It means you attain Nirvana. This level also, in the Theravada, if you attain these five higher levels, from there, you also attain Nibbana. There's no Amitabha uh, in the Theravada conception. Uh, just by a natural course, you get to that level. You can be reborn at a higher level. That means you go from 23 to 24, 24 to 25. But the, the big difference, you've got to be an Anagami in the Theravada conception. And an Anagami is a very, very high attainment. It's one step off the end of samsara altogether. Beyond the rupa loka is the arupa loka, the formless worlds. These correspond to the formless realms, the ayatana, that are built on the basis of the fourth jhana. But in this, re in this realm, there's no form at all. It's only mind. When the Bodhisattva was seeking awakening, if you remember, he went to our Lara Kalama, who was one teacher in India at the time. And our Lara Kalama taught him how to, how to reach Akinjanyatanan, the sphere of nothingness. It's an extremely high level of mental development where the body has completely fallen away. Any kind of knowledge of body or anything like that has fallen away. It's really a, a very high level. But the Buddha attained it and he realized it's still within the realms of samsara. It still is not awakening. Even though it's an extremely high level of mental development. So after that he left Alara and he went to Ramaputta. And Ramaputta taught that his father, Rama, Ramaputta means Rama's son. 
Rama Buddha taught that Rama had attained the sphere of neither perception nor non-perception. And then the Bodhisattva attained that level as well. But he realized that that was still within the realms. It's at the top now. There's nothing above. You're at the very top of existence. At the very top level of samsara, if you like. The most refined state of mind, to put it in psychological terms. But he realized that it, it still wasn't awakening. So after that, he went off to seek awakening. He left uh, Ramaputta, even though Ramaputta put him on the same level and made him teacher over all the, all the people. Samsara, you see, it's a really, really, really big place. There's lots and lots of realms in there. There's loads of fun to be had in samsara. And there's loads of suffering to be had in samsara. And there's wonderful states of mind to be had in samsara. But Nibbana is outside altogether. It's not within anything that you can describe. Everything here from top to bottom, you can describe it. Nibbana, you cannot describe it. And for us as Buddhists, it's good to develop sila and dana and get into higher levels, you know. It's good to develop meditation and get up to these levels. But this is not what you should be practicing for. Really, you need to keep your mind on the end game, which is, if you like, the out game. And that means attaining Nibbana, which is getting out of samsara altogether. Yeah. That's what the Buddha taught the Dhamma for. He didn't teach it for attaining heaven. He specifically told he didn't teach it for attaining heaven, but he taught it for getting out of samsara altogether. So everybody say sadhu.